Hello, everybody. I'm Josh Welsh, president of Film Independent, uh, sitting at home in my oversized cardigan. And uh, thank you all for joining us today for, for this special conversation, uh, part of our Film Independent Presents program um, around the amazing film Nomadland. Um, before we get started, a couple quick thank yous are in order uh, from Film Independent. First off, thank you to the Hollywood Foreign Press Association, our lead funder for our year-round screening program. Thank you so much. Thank you to our screening partner, Vision Media, who makes everything we do possible. And last, but certainly not least, thank you to the Los Angeles Times, ably represented here today by uh, Mark Olson. Um, before I turn it over to Mark, I just wanna, um, I also wanna thank Fox Searchlight. I wanna thank you for everything you do, for distributing this amazing film. And, you know, as we go through this pandemic, I'm more and more recognize different parts of the industry that I, think about in a new way and distributors who are putting out great work. I value them more than I ever have. And just looking at the legacy of Searchlight, the great films that they've supported over the years, we need this to continue. Uh, Searchlight is an amazing company and I couldn't be happier that they are uh, bringing Nomadland to the world. Um, I also just wanna mention um, Molly and Chloe are filmmakers that we've supported at Film Independent for a long time and so, so happy for both of you and the entire Nomadland team here today. Um, congrats on this film. Everyone's talking about it as, you know, oh, it's on the, it's on so-and-so's list for best films of the year. That's all great, but this film transcends year-end best of list by a mile and a half by so much. This is a film that people are gonna be talking about and watching for years. It's such a, a stunning, remarkable, original film. Um, I could go on in, in Chris Farley mode and gushing over the film and the filmmakers, but I think I should stop and turn it over to um, a brilliant critic and writer, uh, the one and only Mark Olson. Mark, take it away. Thank you, Josh. And it's really my pleasure to be here today to, to lead this conversation on Nomadland, which is already one of the most acclaimed films of the year. It's winner of the Golden Lion at the Venice Film Festival, the People's Choice Award, the Toronto International Film Festival, and the Golden Frog at the Camera Image Festival. And so we're joined today by producer Peter Spears, producer Dan Janvey, producer Molly Asher, and producer, director, writer, and editor Chloe Ja. Thanks to all of you for, for being here today. And I, I think the film has just a really deceptive simplicity to it. And so I want to start by asking uh, the rubber, the rubber tramp rodeo, or, sorry, the rubber tramp rendezvous that takes place in, in the film. It's a real event, but you all sort of staged it for the purposes of the film. Chloe, can you talk a little bit about that? Why something like that was something you had to sort of put on for the purposes of the film? Well, I, I'm going to throw that to Molly Asher. Because <laughs> that, that lady over there made it happen. So you go ahead, Molly. Um, well, I mean, it's 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 like a, a such an important event for for the nomads, and um, and so yeah, we well, we talked about actually maybe putting it on during the real RTR, but then realized that we needed to have more control over it ourselves, so we actually staged it to be a little bit right before the real RTR, and um, yeah, it took it. There were about fifty vans or you know homes, um, and uh, it took a few months to put together. Um, and then, and then the, the the joy of seeing it all all um, coordinated and set up was uh, truly remarkable. I wish we had a video of the behind the scenes of that particular day. <laughs> you will see how now, how now glamorous filmmaking is when you see that video. <laughs> but it was a real trip too, because like we staged an RTR, and then the people who are in our RTR ended up just having their own little. Nomadland RTR experience. Right, so the, right. The they all stayed there. How, how reality and fiction are intersecting in that RTR is kind of like a little bit hard to. And we recreated an RTR from like the early years, which was a smaller event. And as we are finishing, it dovetails into the real RTR that was happening, which now has grown from like, a, you know, what, 50 people originally to, you know, 3,000 people. 10, were there. I think 10,000 this year, the last year. 10,000, yeah. Because as you're shooting the movie, and I understand it was kind of an extended shoot, like over many months, is it sort of a traveling production? Like I, when I'm watching the movie, I kept thinking about when you're in a location, 
you're probably not going back there. So like, Chloe, what's it like having the production kind of on the move like that? I'm just being kept in this very protective bubble by my amazing producing team. <laughs> You know, I wake up in the morning, I say, these are the new pages, and then make it happen. And then I go eat my food, and then I go to set. And just everything, sometimes we got there the night before, sometimes we got there in the morning of. But magically, you know, I got there, things are ready for me. And these are some of the casts they found locally for me to pick from. Um, so I think I've probably seen the, the least dramatic and interesting version <laughs> of that because I've been kept very safe, um, but I'm sure the, the others have seen the less fun part of that, like, you know, having to, to, to be on the move the whole time. It's like a caravan, isn't it? It's just, yeah. And we shoot yeah. along the way from, from one, one location to the next. Like mm -hmm. there wasn't a moment that was lost where we didn't try and get, get stuff. One of my favorite memories of you, Chloe, was directing the shots that we would get between locations. Like, <laughs> truly not a moment lost of filmmaking. Yeah. Uh, and Peter, can you talk a little bit just about the logistics of that, of having a production on the move in this way? I imagine it's much different from a, a more conventional shoot. Yeah, I, I mean, I can talk a little bit about my experience with it. It was very different from how I've you know, made a movie before. Uh, it wasn't so very different from the way Molly made a movie because Molly and Chloe would work together uh, on, on together and Dan comes also from uh, a very production past and, uh, but some of that being with Ben Seitling and working with real people. So their, their addition to the team really uh, created for us the, the safety net of knowing that we, it could be done. But even, even more, I think, uh, helpful or equally helpful was this, um, early sort of boot camp that we did in August, uh, September, where we actually shot for two months uh, because we needed some summer scenes. But we also, I think Chloe really understood that we were all gonna have to figure out how, how we were gonna move as this caravan and this family and how would we all trust each other and how, how this would happen when we were shooting in the winter months and we had half the amount of time each day and we're freezing and we're sleeping in you know horrible conditions and stuff you know it was so good to have had this kind of boot camp experience that she really built into and we all built into the schedule uh, but once we had that and had that muscle memory uh, when we picked back up a few months later and we're shooting again we fell right into this rhythm which also allowed us I think the success of Chloe handing us new pages every morning and even though it was it was new things that we had to shoot. We, it was within the framework of, of this uh, skeleton that had been created for months. Um, and with the help of, you know, just 30, well, how, what was our crew size? 34? 30, 32 or like 23 or 24, I think. So being small also helped us to really pivot and to be very stealth in our abilities to kind of get in and out of where we needed to go or to change direction if the story required it uh, on a given morning. Because Molly, is this similar to the other films that you've made with Chloe? Like, is this a process that the two of you have kind of developed for how to, how to make movies? Well, this is the first one where it's been traveling, but it is similar in the sense of the small, nimble crew um, and working with with non-professional actors and and being able to be flexible, um, both with what Chloe is discovering with with um, with her actors and also what the the place and the land is kind of giving us so in that way it, it is very similar because chloe can you talk a little bit about writing to locations like do you are you looking for something and you have to find it or you're like in a place and you write to it i'm wondering specifically there's that huge truck stop where david straight Aaron's character starts working as a as a grill cook and that just looks like a a really wild place to be this just labyrinth uh, a labyrinthine place. And so do you find that place and think, oh, well, we have to shoot here? Or are you looking for something that you need that's like that? It's crazy to my parents back home that I know more about war drugs, South Dakota <laughs> than I do of anywhere in Beijing. <laughs> I've known war drugs, South Dakota for about four or five years before I decided to write it into the film because that's the, the that's the spot. Um, um, you know, we shot two films in South Dakota in that area. Been to Wardrocks many times. Always wanted to put it on film. 
And this is just seemed to be the perfect, and they have seasonal working program when Molly came back and said, oh yeah, they do have that. I go, oh, let's write that into to the script. But for me, you know, with the, with the team, with the producing team, earlier on, it's like, how do we set parameters so we could uh, uh, be free? The parameters are the locations, is the map. So, so, so even though everything else could be changed, but these are the location we, we, we're going to, and we're shooting at this time of the year. So that was actually the starting point. And then once we decide those, I write within those locations. Because Dan, what are your experiences like in having a production like this on the move? Like what, what are the advantages of it? And are there any headaches that it creates? Um, I don't know, it's my first time doing it. I, I will say that I'm fascinated by the question of like it being different. I, I, don't, I don't think it's that different from, I, I mean this in a good way. I find it to be actually quite an intuitive and conventional process. And I think that comes from Chloe and Chloe and Josh, and there's a very clear way to make the movie, and it requires being prepared in advance to then be open to whatever is happening. So, Chloe, I think you just said it perfectly. It's like there really is a screenplay that you're prepping the way you would prep a fiction film, like mm -hmm. the same breakdowns, the same preparation, and then the only thing that changes is just kind of a certain mentality of how you approach your day. So. And that comes from how Chloe and Chloe and Josh are shooting the scenes and having an openness to adjust the story to what's in front of them. Um, and, and no, I, don't, I, I thought it was incredible. It's like, you'd think it's impossible to go on the road and do this, but it's like, you're not, you're, you're not I kind of think it's simpler than people think because it's like, you're on an away job. So it doesn't matter if you're staying in Wall Drug or, or Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. I don't really think so if you just plan ahead about travel days. So it's not a glamorous answer, but I do think in a nuts and bolts way, it's not as different as you'd think. Like we, like to, we like to create our own myth, but yeah. the, you're getting the truth here. Yeah. It's really not like that, that different. And also, yeah, I, I, I think it's, um, it's interesting because we, we, we usually get like, oh, so did, it, did that just happen? Like the trick is for the from the producing team and from you know uh, the creative team, is to make it feel like that you actually think we're lucky enough just show up and got it. But months, months of the planning has to be done ahead of time. So me and Josh and friend and and the actors we can be as free as we want to. Because every time we make a decision that is not planned, they've planned every possible scenario that they will have it ready to supply what we want. You got lucky though a few times where you, you you turned to me a few times and said, I always have weather luck. I have well, weather is something, yes. And you know what? But at the same time, weather is like, uh, I remember the day when we were going to shoot something else and they go, oh, the, the, the biggest hurricane in the Greece and history is coming. National Geographic are sending photographers. So you have to <laughs> shut down. Well, we all just looked at each other. There was not much said. I go, oh, we're going to go shoot that hurricane. And literally in about five minutes, the camera's ready to go. There's no question asked, you know, and everybody's on the way. And I, I walk on up to that cliff and I, I, nobody can hear each other. Josh can barely stand, but the whole team is out there. And I was watching it thinking, there's not much for me to do <laughs> except watching it happen. Um, but for that, that's such a key moment in the film that we ended up with fur on that cliff. But the reason why we could react to what all weather god is because the team is ready at all times. Yeah. I know, Peter, I want to ask you just about the origins of the project. You sort of, you know, you you found the book uh, by Jessica Bruder and, and you and Francis optioned it together. And it seems so unusual to, uh, you know, to option a nonfiction book to then make a fiction film out of it. it. Is this the movie that you and Francis thought you were going to be making when you when you optioned the book? No, not at all. It's uh it, it is. Uh, I think when we optioned it, we thought that Francis would play Linda May, and it would be a you know an adaptation of that book, telling Linda's story from the time that Linda, you know, this her struggles ending with her, and in the book, she ultimately buys a bit of land and starts to build her uh, um, Earth ship, and uh, these, uh, and so 
we, you know, very traditional idea of that. But it, at about the same time we optioned this book, uh, then Frances uh, was at Toronto and uh, she slipped out of some publicity as she want to do. And she went to go see uh, the writer and uh, she called me afterwards and she said, I, I, you've got to see this movie. I, I think I found the person who's Who's gonna? Who should direct our film? And so I got a link. I saw it as well, and uh, and we knew immediately. And then we got together on the day of the Independent Spirit Awards, actually in 2017. Uh, Chloe was there for the writer, and I was there for Call Me by Your Name, and Francis was there for Three Billboards, and and we all got together at, at Francis's apartment, and Fra and that was when Chloe said. Well, perhaps it's Linda's story, but perhaps it's something else. And she started to pitch us on the beginnings of her ideas about this, which were really born of the more you got to know Francis, right, Chloe? I mean, yeah. I, I mean, yeah. Fern really in lots of ways is Fran. Yeah, it's her saying like, I want to be Fern. Like she, she was telling me her alter ego, Fern. We'll go, okay, well, that's the main character in the movie. Let's start from there. Yeah, and as soon as I, and as soon as Chloe said, "This is maybe though how we're going to make this movie," that's when also Francis and I said, "Okay, well we're in a completely new ballpark for us," and that's uh, and that's when Dan and Molly joined us uh, and came in, and and that's where we all really got kicked off and began. I know Molly, you obviously had already collaborated with Chloe on a, your two previous films, but Dan, how did you kind of enter the picture here? What brought you to the project? Um, I, had, I had been a fan of the movies. I, I saw songs at Sundance, like at its premiere and loved that film. And then obviously loved the writer. And, and Chloe, you and I had kept in touch over the years. I called so. him and said, please do this. That's what happened. <laughs> yeah, that's All right. <laughs> that's a, I was somewhere in a small town in Colorado. I was like, Dan, Jesse, any help? Um, I, it, was, it, was a, it was a funny conversation. Like Chloe was like, can you do this? I was like, yeah, let's, let's do it. And I think my only question is, are there boats and children? And once she said no, I was oh, like, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think I think that I had had a. It, it was kind of an interesting. I guess the real answer is like, I had worked in a studio context with non-professional performers. It's probably the real answer. I I guess that's probably why you called me, Chloe. I've never asked you. Because <laughs> you're really good at with boats and children. So I thought. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect. No, I mean, Dan had collaborated with Searchlight, you know, and uh, he also um, had just, I remember doing songs when I was in the labs. I, I used to go to the team of Beast of Southern Wild, ask them how do you audition, how do you do that? You know, I did go, I did reach out for help. So it's, it feels like a, a, a organism that we all exist in different places. It's just a matter of time our, our, our road cross, paths cross. And Chloe, can you little talk a little bit more about the adaptation process? Like you had the book, you had this concept of, you know, this character of, of Fern. How did you kind of go from there? Like how much of the book is in the movie? A lot, um, a lot. Like Linda May, Swanky Bob Wells, and, you know, some of the characters and also all the major locations, you know, Empire, Nevada, Corsat, Arizona, Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. These are all... The, the idea of seasonal working, Amazon Warehouse, Fernley, you know, Desert Rose RV Park, just the, the kind of the world building is so rich in Jessica's book. What my goal was that it's, it was a pretty simple but not easy task was that how could we create a character inspired by Fran that can gel what Jessica already has in her book together. Um, so that was, you know, um, that, that, that was the goal. I'd seen in another interview where Frances described the character of Fern as being like a docent, that she sort of is like a guide leading the audience through this world. Is that how you, do you think you, Chloe, conceived of the, the character that way too? Well, I kind of have to, you know, because, because okay, well, I remember that in our first meeting, uh, Fran also said, is, is there, because I think she assumed I want to make a version with just non-professional actors having seen the writer. And I felt this specific film because the writer was very focused on one person and his own family. But this one, I just knew is a road movie that we wanted to include as many interesting stories as possible in the oral 
storytelling tradition of of really the the you know the the American road uh, it's it's all part of it. People sit down, let's just tell a story as an oral history, and I would really like that idea. And in the film, you see people just start talking about their lives. And in order to make that into a fictional film, in my mind, you need a very, very strong listener. And you need someone who has such strong presence that the audience aren't gonna pick up the phone. They're gonna listen because she, firm, she is listening. And I don't think there's many out there that could be as strong as Frances McDormand when she looked you in the eyes. Uh, so, yeah. And Molly, what was it like mixing professional actors, I mean, Francis McDormand and David Strathairn, with these non-professional actors and, and real life nomads? Well, in a lot of ways, you know, like when working with non-professional actors, there's, you you work, at, at least from my my end of things, in a very similar way, you know, there's, there's still contracts, you know, there's still all of those things and understanding what the parameters of what a day shooting is. I mean, there's a little bit of that of explaining maybe what that, what to expect. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's always the, it was really fun though, to, to be with the non-professional actors and see them responding with, with Francis and with David. And, um, I mean, at one point, I think we were looking for David and we're like, where is he? Where'd he go? And then we realized that he was like, he was over with all of the other, all of the other van dwellers at the RTR and we, he just like melded in with them. <laughs> yeah. It was great. And Peter, what were your, oh, sorry, were you going to say well, something I wanted, else? I wanted to add a little bit to that, to Chloe talking about um, Fran being a good listener. I often think that like what makes these this film what it is, is that everybody is a good listener, like from Chloe to Josh being being so, as he's shooting, like listening to to where people are are looking and 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 taking that in, as well as all of our crew too. I feel like that's, mm -hmm. and, and that comes across. Yeah, I think it's an active listening that isn't, and it's not like a performance in active listening. I mean, it literally is a, when you get to live with these people and, and we all became a family, certainly the crew, but also with the people we were living with and embedded with for four months, like it's just this shared humanity, right? Like, like you're listening to them in the way you'd listen, or most of us listen to a family member or somebody. It's, it's you because you, you want it's it's the um, it's such an organic feeling to want to be present and understand and connected with them and uh, and that connection I think is is make is what you feel feel becomes kinetic and and what you feel on film. Because Dan, I, I've seen you say how you kind of had to cast the crew in a way. You had to be sure that the people working on the movie were people who could kind of hang with working in this manner. I think so. Yeah, I th I think that's hundred percent true. I mean, like one of the special things about the experience was the degree to which the crew internalized the core values of how Chloe wanted to make the movie. And it was very clear, like actors are a part of your family. Sorry, not professional performers have to be treated like actors and part of the family. And also one unique aspect about how Chloe works, which was new to me was we did have a traditional kind of busy production around the shoot, but we, we thought about physical space very specifically to preserve like an inner circle core experience that was as unencumbered by noise and busy crew as possible. And so there was like this incredible dance that I, I frankly had nothing to do with other than just like watching it I thought there was an incredible dance between art, camera, grip, electric, about what they needed to do to set up shots to then let the shots happen. Um, so, but but I guess Chloe, my my impression of it is like that basically just happened intuitively to this group of people. You were dancing on the outskirt. Yeah, on my phone. Team. On my They're phone. always fun. Running right? out of shot. I'm running out of shot. So majority of time is about dodging, myself included, getting out of the shot. <laughs> Josh could just turn the camera. Sometimes I'm like, you doing this on purpose. <laughs> well, that's how you clear the set. Just move the camera. But it looks like a little organism, or like an organism, yeah. like moving all around, like <laughs> like, like the magnets, you know, that's like that's pushing the other magnets away. Every time the camera is away, it's just scatter. People scatter. 
but there's a humility to the crew of like it's not about like it's it's not about like if you think about grip and electric it's like there's kind of a humility of like the process is the priority yeah and supporting the process like i think was internalized yeah. and I want to make sure to just ask about Fern's van that I think on like a larger production, you'd assume there'd maybe be multiple vans. I don't know if there was just one van here and also having it kitted out in the way that it, that it is. I mean, Molly, can you talk a little bit about just procuring and sort of preparing that van? There was discussion of having more than one van. Yeah. Um, uh, well, well, finding the van in and of itself for, Somehow I was finding the van. I'm like a horrible driver. I live in New York. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> We're not letting but Molly it, drive the van. No, <laughs> no, no. But I found it. Well, I found actually my my a friend of my father's from high school lived in lives in LA and is like a car guy. And my dad told me this, so I called him up, and he helped us find this van. He met Chloe at this at the at this used uh, car place <laughs> and found our wonderful Vanguard. Um, but yeah, we, we, we did make the decision to only have one van, but we had a, a, a trailer that we, that we um, transported it to um, two places so that it wasn't having so much mileage on it. But, but Chloe can speak to Josh really like building the whole inside of that van, which is hopefully someday people can go and enjoy it for themselves. I'm laughing because um, because there's just one van. Some days when someone's driving and I'm driving behind, I'm thinking, if that van skid off the road, what are we gonna do? <laughs> well, and with Francis driving it, it was cool. yes. A lot of times, Francis, I'm driving my van. Uh, so we're just thinking, that's it. That's the movie right there. Are we gonna go shoot just some landscapes? Um, yeah. But that's you know again like a leap of faith, right? Like, obviously, there is preparation, preparation, preparation. But there's at some point, you just got to take the plunge. And that's what we did. We were not, we were ready, but we were also not ready. We can never be completely ready to make a role movie like this. It's not possible. So at some point, also, that, yeah, go on. Oh, so good. Well, we also said at one point, like, if it did, if it, there was a crash, like, if it did get hurt, that you would work that in somehow. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think I said. <laughs> Just keep shooting, right? You keep shooting. Right. Uh, and I say yes. For uh, the, the the one thing I just want to say that about that van is that you know we we had the the the, the funding to build it on the stage, um, and then really allow the camera to shoot from different angles, and so Josh can do his thing. But him being the DP and the and the the the, the production designer, I think it was very important for him to feel the kind of authenticity that you would feel in that van as if you're in there with her. There can only be two people fit in there, three tops. And when you're in there with her, you can only be in certain places. And if the camera can go places that you can't go, um, obviously for other types of films, it's great. But for this film that you really, you know, we really want you to feel like that's that small crime space. And um, I think it was a lot of discipline on his behalf to not, have the advantage even though we can afford it because limitation has always been our best friend making our first two films and we try to keep remind ourselves that for this one and then chloe i want to be sure to ask you about the fact that you you edit the film yourself what is it that you sort of get from from doing that yourself and is it something that you're thinking about even while you're shooting like do you know what you can and can't shoot because you know what you do and don't need when you're editing well, I've always edited the first pass of my my films, and and I I love editing. I probably love it more than directing. <laughs> and I just I just love it. And I think it's because growing up mainly um, growing up on manga and comic books for me, I I read more manga than I did books, and and it's like stories always happens in frames for me. Um, and so which makes me sometimes a pretty annoying writer and director because I'm editing in my head. So I, I would get notes that put, put a little more in the script for people who doesn't see the edit in your head. Or, or um, sometimes for actors as well, you know, like I, I, I would just need that exact bit. I know I, I need when they're like, well, I'm ready to give you a lot more, you know, who else have a sound set? <laughs> so it's not always easy, but by the same time, it, it, 
it comes in handy when you don't have enough time, when you have limited. And I was a, you know, for Josh knows how I'm going to edit the film. He's going to shoot a certain way. And by the end, Fran knows exactly what I needed because she's seen what I was trying to do with her at the end of a lot of improv that she comes in to do exactly what I need to make the scene work based on what we got. So some decisions are made on the spot like that. And then we have time for some questions we've got in the in the chat here from the audience. And the so the first question is toward the beginning of the film, there's a scene where Frances has to break character and gives her real ID to an RV park clerk. What went into the decision to keep that scene in the film? It, it really elevates the stakes and kind of gives a sense of how realistic the film truly is. There's also a scene in the film where a police officer literally calls her Francis and, and reads out her name. I like Easter eggs in movies, so <laughs> I, I don't know. I think everyone is 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 all in Dave's name is Dave, you know, and and the 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 uh, James, the guy that plays Dave's son, James is Dave's son. You know, there's just a lot of it's it, it just being playful. You know, I think it's a, a bit tongue in cheek, a bit playful, but it's also has the audience go, is, did I just see? You know, it, just being playful, really. And then we have another question here, which is, can you talk about the challenges that come with shooting primarily exteriors? I mean, does that create logistical issues as far as having cover sets if there's bad weather? Like, what, what does shooting outdoors the way that you do, how does that impact the production? I just love doing it, and I like the people who have to suffer the consequences talk about it. <laughs> I, I don't think there's an alternative. I mean, we don't. I don't think we ever had a discussion about like a cover set. Yeah, because we just, we'd also knew that that Chloe and Josh could, and would and like to, to to use what what the what the weather is giving us. Although I mean, there would be days where we we would in the morning the light wouldn't be the way that you guys were wanting it for that particular scene, so we might shift and do a different different scene so that we, so that so that it was like if it was a hugely sunny day. Yeah. It, and then another question. We lucky, oh. and we got very lucky weather-wise for the most part. Chloe, can you can you talk about the research that you did into the nomad lifestyle? Did you do a lot of traveling yourself? Yeah, I mean, I have traveled that way quite a bit, making my first two films, and then uh, Nomadland. Again, the book is so rich, and the people in the book, once they open up to us, that collaboration uh, with with Bob Wells, you know, with Linda May Swanky and Sue Ann Carson, who is the, the woman who did the uh, bucket demonstration, you know, she really opened up her community to us. And, and um, um, I didn't really spend like years and years researching, no. Um, it, it was a very quick process. Once I read the book, a few months later, we were ready to go. Um, be, just, I think partially because the nature of making a road movie, you know, and, and, and there's not like a one culture, one type of people that hit the road. It's very different than going to one place on a reservation in South Dakota. You could be you and me tomorrow, we'll become nomads. Once we lose, you know, once we decide to let go of, of, of this house and then go. So it, it could be anybody, really, you know, it's not like a culture you have to get into and understand. You have to understand how to use a bucket. That way you have some street cred when you talk to <laughs> <laughs> But Peter, does the production have to kind of make some inroads with the, you know, some aspect of the nomad community to, you know, find who some of these real people are, to sort of like be involved in some of these real life events? Yeah, Is so that for, a Yeah, for sure, for sure. But the real key to that in so many ways was also Jessica Bruder, uh, who had written the book. So she had really we really piggybacked on a lot of the research she did and the connections she had made and, and the trust that she had developed with these people. And so, you know, uh, I think it was the day after the Independent Spirit Awards that Chloe was online doing some research and she typed in uh, Rubber Tramp Rendezvous uh, and she realized that like that was the last day it was happening for, until another year. And so she jumps in her car that day. If I think I have this right, you drive yeah. there in, in Quartzsite, Arizona. It's about a uh, probably a four hour drive. And you just got there in time that last day before we would have lost a year uh, to meet Bob Wells. I think you got to meet, and, and Jessica had arranged. So Jessica knew you were coming. She called or emailed some people and said, 
you know, get some entree for you. And then you, you were able to begin making those connections uh, before we had the ticking clock of another year when the next uh, rendezvous would happen. And then another question. Uh, the film has such an incredible supporting cast. Swanky's monologue in the van was particularly moving. How much of that dialogue is improvised or, or written? And what's the process like in, in getting that performance from a non-professional actor? I think it's all in the writing, really. It's not that different from what, what any writer would do. You know, you, you interview people and then you listen to them. And then Swanky told me a lot of stories about her life. And this is this particular story and the, the video she showed me that you, you end up seeing in the film. Uh, almost right away, I go, that has to make into the script. And so while I was writing Fern's journey, I made sure in a way that I can incorporate Swanky in a way that these things could be part of. So, so there's in the script and then on the day I will give Swanky this edited version of the story she told me once, but it's picked and edited. And, and, and then in that moment, she looked at it, she might, in, she might go off a little bit improv here and there, um, but there's a blueprint which is quite close to, because it's, sometimes it's translated from what she has said to me, and she's just repeating the story in the moment. And obviously, by connecting to a friend in that moment, something else might have come up in her that I didn't predict. Um, but it's not like showing up and just tell me something about your life, because then you'll be there for days. <laughs> <laughs> And then this leads into another question, which is, Chloe, can you talk a little bit about your collaboration uh, with Josh and the sense of how you kind of work out blocking? Do you do begin a day with a, a shot list? Like, how do the two of you collaborate in, in capturing the images? I, I'm actually really curious to hear what you guys think, because I actually, honestly, I don't know what we do because it's all, it's been too long. It's like, oh, married couple, I have no idea. But I'm sure when you're watching, you can analyze it a bit more since you guys will, is literally right next to us and have to hear what we need from, you know, I would have to give you things to do. Molly, I mean, do you my, have any in, insight on that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my, I always understood that you guys did have a, a, a shot list. And I think that like, over the years, I feel like, like starting with songs, maybe it might have been not as as clear as it was at starting to get with the writer and then with this. And so it is, um, and you're track, and it seems that you're tracking like what you know you need to get visually, um, and uh, yeah. I, I think the analogy of the old married couple you joke about Chloe, but it felt like that even from you know just like the way just so symbiotic, how you complete each other's thoughts and sentences often and knew just instinctually that he knew you wanted a certain thing at this moment, or you, you know, there was a shorthand between the two of you that made it very easy for us to, uh, you know, just get into the rhythm with you and, and support that. We also fought a lot, yeah. you know, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's also because because when you when you get really comfortable you, you I think the, the the friction the disagreement um, and it's just constantly wanting just a little more out of what we can get just being very greedy and pushing each other uh, some days are good and some days not so great but then the good days really is worth it you know um, uh, yeah the crazy thing for me Chloe like in thinking about the question is after going through the entire cycle with you guys is how like divided my head is about like in some sense you guys have the openness of like less blank in his camera mm -hmm. like and who's to me the great documentarian mm -hmm. and on the other sense you're also sitting there as like a party of two doing the type of shot listing and st shot structuring of like a Scorsese film you know, or something super planned. So well, yeah. I can't make sense of how it's both things at once. <laughs> and that to me is the magic. It's like you retain the openness to what's happening in front of you, but you apply like a cinematic rigor of the edit and how the shots are, are going to cut together that is very rooted in narrative cinema and has nothing to do with documentary. I'm glad you say that because Josh is going to be annoyed if I didn't point out there was preparation. And I think it's true because I think he, um, there's a set of lenses that we choose from. We're very, very strict about that to a point it's almost 
un unnecessary, but we, we, we have faith in that it's done as well as three films, and for me, four films now, is that there is only three or four lenses I use, and I will not change it. You know, that means that Josh has to move physically. We have to physically get close to the, 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 the subject and get away. And for a film that can go as vast and, and, and unpredictable, the, the visual language has to be really uh, consistent for it to feel that kind of cinematic, the, the density, there has to be a discipline to it. And I've definitely learned that, like Molly said, from my first film, just did whatever it wanted. And then slowly realized that coming into the edit room going, oh shit, you know, this doesn't feel like it fit. And slowly realized these disciplines are really important. And the disciplines go extend to how you think about color, how you think about mm -hmm. art, right. like mm -hmm. they're, they're, it's, it's true narrative filmmaking in that way. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I'm fascinated by the two, the two worlds of cinema colliding into something that I think is distinct to the two of you. And sort of on those same technical lines, there's another question that's about the sound in the film. Mm -hmm. Is there any difficulties with location sound recording like this? I mean, how are you using labs or booms or like how are you getting, because the sound in the movie, it seems really impeccable, especially considering the locations that you're in. You guys need to talk about Wolf because I get emotional. Yeah, Clark, I was going to say when we first started talking about the movie, you're like, "There's one human being <laughs> who can do the sound for this, and his yeah. name is Wolf." Yeah. He's very passionate about no no lobs. No like, lobs. So he, he's very no very lobs. passionate about booming himself too, um, because he feels that that's part of the whole art of of the sound and getting into it. It's, Oh yeah, I mean, I made four films, and I have people that this in post production and sound goes. I don't know how you guys did it, but this is the best dialogue I've ever seen. You're, you're just like in the out there in that kind of situation. How did this person do it? And uh, you know, and I, I, it's just you have to be on the whole time. It's really hard to find a mixer and all for he's, he, he does both himself and there's not a second he's slacking off he's constantly listening and he is always he's in sync with josh it's like they they move as as one entity to a point where i never talk need to talk to him he just shows up where he is and i got used to it so much one time he clearly told everyone that he's going to the bathroom and i just wrote a whole take until francis I don't think Booth is here, Chloe. <laughs> oh shit! You know, it's that one time because like, he clearly said I'm leaving. Because it's that kind of commitment you get, and also performance. Because I don't wear, um, I don't wear this this stuff. What do you call it? Like cans. I don't wear them on set. Not very rarely. So a lot of times I'm not hearing the performance how it should be, and I heavily rely on always look over at Wolf, and then he will just. He will not, and he will go one more, and then I, I go ahead. You know, I trust him in that way as well. Truly, like a weirdly spiritual component to that wolf fellow. Yeah, <laughs> like, it's unique. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, maybe to to conclude, Chloe, I I just want to ask you, did it seem unusual to you to make this movie that is you know a fictional adaptation of a of a non fiction book and did it fit well do you think into your the style that you've been developing of these sort of very realistic naturalistic feeling fiction films like did it kind of make sense to you to make this this adaptation of the of the book yes because uh, the first two films in a way that is is, is a fictionalized version of a non-fiction world and Jessica just had basically done two, three years of my own research. I need to do it if I didn't have her and her book. Uh, so the process is very, very similar. And is it meaningful to you to sort of like, what is it that draws you to create these, these sort of very realistic portraits of the world? Well, I'm, I'm just someone that, that passed through, you know, like I, I, I don't belong anywhere and I pass through and uh, there, there are times that I wanted to stop and wanted to learn and, and I feel so curious about their way of life and how they see the world and somehow I know going into it is going to make myself a fuller human being and that's, that's what makes me want to make these films and, and uh, I've never been disappointed once. <laughs>
<laughs> and with that, we'll uh, wrap up this conversation. I want to thank all of you for joining us. Producers Peter Spears, Dan, Dan, Dan Janvey, and Molly Asher, and producer, writer, director, and editor, Chloe Zhao. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.